Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. There you go, Mike or Dave, we can hear you now. OK, good. OK, hi, everybody and uh, good. Good morning, good, good day, good evening, whatever you are and welcome to um, the uh, my session. Um, let me start up the presentation and, and if it's OK, you will see the first slide and this session. Um, Are you seeing my slides currently or not? Not yet. See something. There you go. Yeah. Like before, we had to start a, a shut down and start again. OK, hi, everybody. Welcome to the session uh, Protecting Mail Flow, a practical approach. Um, my name is Dave Stork. Uh, my contact info is on uh, the left bottom uh, screen. And um, well, currently uh, the agenda of this uh, current session is just a, for a short introduction. Who am I? Um, why I wanted to do this session? Um, then we'll uh, start on some SMTP uh, uh, basics um, because those are quite important for understanding what we are trying to solve. Um, and that is uh, the authentication of mail with SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. I will also uh, talk about uh, BME a little bit um, and then uh, fixing forwarding with SRS and ARC. Um, so um, those are the topics for today. Um, who am I? I'm, I'm Dave Stork, uh, currently a cloud architect at Simplify Now and a um, Microsoft MVP since uh, 2014 in the Exchange and later on the Microsoft 365 apps and services uh, category. Um, I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer since 2015. Um, and um, also I'm a contributor at practicalpowershell.com um, where there are some uh, several books, ebooks, um, regarding PowerShell and uh, Microsoft 365. Um, I have a blog, uh, GitHub, um, and one interesting fact perhaps is that I needed three attempts to pass the Exchange 2003 exam. So, uh, um, um, uh, and that it has been a long time ago since then I've, I've passed every ex Exchange exam the first try, even in beta. So just, just, just to let you show that um, if you think, okay, I, I didn't pass my exam, well, no worries, just try again and uh, you'll possibly end up like me. Uh, if you would like that. So what is the goal of this session? Uh, like I said, I want to show you the SMTP mail file auth authenticity issues that there are um, and especially how to quickly address those issues um, in, a, in a quite easy way. And that means that I uh, won't go into every nook and cranny and details of um, uh, all of the things you have to do to protect your mail flow. Um, but um, the other motivation I had is that um, because I've seen that there's not the adoption I would like to see in all of those situations in, in, in organizations, or there's a misconfiguration or misconceptions and stuff like that. So the adoption could be better um, and things could be uh, often a lot more stricter than they are. Um, unfortunately, not everybody has the time to uh, read all the RFCs or these technical specifications uh, of each of those uh, protocols, which is understandable. Um, so um, uh, that is the, the goal of this session, uh, specifically the STP mail for authenticity. If you are more interested in uh, protecting mail transport, uh, for instance, with TLS, uh, uh, MTA, STS, and Dane, um, I suggest you watch the uh, recording of the other session, Securing Mail Flow in Exchange Online. Um, that was uh, yesterday, but all of those sessions are recorded so you could uh, later watch them. Um, another recommendation of mine is the deep dive increasing mail flow security posture. 
Um, that is uh, quite a, 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 a aptly named um, deep dive because they go real deep into specific um, man in the middle attacks and some spoofing scenarios that kind of touch on uh, what I'm talking here about. So um, without further ado, let's dive in into my session into SNTP basics. Uh, SNTP stands for the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Um, it's defined in RFC 5321. Uh, and 5322 um, and um, uh, was designed like in, in the 70s and 80s and have been updated um, going through the years, um, especially because um, one thing in wasn't in the first mind of the designers was security and authenticity of mail. Um, and with authenticity of mail of the whether a mail is authentic, it means that the sending organization is actually uh, the organization that has sent that mail and the receiving side uh, can verify that and can authenticate that mail. Um, so let's see a simple uh, telnet session. You could try that yourself as well. I, I feel that this is a very good training uh, exercise as well. Um, so um, if you uh, connect with Telnet to an Exchange server in this case, uh, you see the banner at first with some specific information, the date and time and stuff like that. Um, and then um, the sending server is uh, sending an hello and giving its uh, full qualified domain name. The receiving server responds with uh, all of the options that are available for the sending server, um, and especially at the first line um, says, and let's turn on my laser pointer, is the 250 and then responding with the hello IP address, and this is the IP address of the sending server. Um, and all these are specific capabilities that the sending server can use um, um, during um, that this specific session. Um, it, it, this is a internal uh, exchange connection and depending on your receive connector and on, on exchange, um, you will see different uh, configuration and it also depends on what kind of uh, receiving uh, platform you have. First off, it starts with the mail from. This is the sending uh, server that uh, identifies the sending. Um, receiving server says OK, and then uh, the sending server uh, uh, communicates to which um, mailbox it has to receive or has to send that mail. In this case, that mail address exists and is valid. That server accepts that, so it communicates that. And after that, you, the sending server is uh, stating data. Uh, and after that, the actual transportation of the uh, most important information of that mail or the actual mail is sent. Um, and you have to uh, disconnect with uh, carriage line feed dot carriage line feed. And this is an example of uh, some, some text. And you'll see here that some things are um, visible, like subject or the from address and then the body and stuff like that. And additional headers can be added here as well. Um, so, and this is a very yeah. basic mail. Um, so, and if you uh, end the transmission, then the receiving server states with, uh, okay, we've uh, accepted that mail is queued and for delivery or something similar. Um, so, this um, um, is a very simple trans transport. Um, and uh, what I wanted to highlight is um, two specific mail froms. Those are quite important in all of the discussions. Um, so um, you have here the uh, uh, mail from journey connection. It's also called the RFC 5221.from. Uh, from. Um, I will also believe that it, it's also called the P1. Um, and the other from uh, is the RFC 5222.from. I always get those mixed up, so don't worry if you don't remember, but the, I wanted to highlight that there are two different from addresses because that is a very uh, important part. I see a question about uh, how you do. How do you add the display name? Basically in this line in the from the, uh, uh, external at mail.com and on behind that you have the uh, brackets with the display name and the uh, 
um, um, emo client will render that um, depending on what kind of client it is, it, either it shows that uh, um, um, name or uh, in the case of uh, Exchange and Outlook, it will uh, do a lookup in the address book and will show the discipline name that is present in your own organization. So it kind of depends on how um, it is sent by the sender and how it is perceived by um, the receiving side and the client. Um, these are those specifics how to format that are, I believe, also indicated in the RFC 5222 um, 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 uh, request, request for comment. So, and indeed, it is part of the data um, uh, transmission. So, uh, but to highlight the most important things from this transmission is um, the different mail forms. And how does that look like in uh, uh, in the receiving end? Um, in this case, it's very simple. The external mail is the same, and here you see the data. Just to see, just to prove that this um, uh, actual test telnet test mail has been received. And if you look at the uh, headers in that received mail, uh, you see all the transport information, obviously, um, and then here you see the from uh, address and the return path address um i will come back to that those what what those exactly mean uh obviously you have the two and the subject and some additional message information um so and what i wanted to highlight was the um different from addresses um so at first in the data uh, from um, um uh, where you could add a display name or something like that that is the this is piece of information and that um, from address that was used during the initial um, transmission. So before the data is now uh, relegated or now tra uh, translated as the return path uh, mail address. And if a mail uh, cannot be received or the mailbox quota has been received and stuff like that, you, uh, the uh, receiving server will send that mail back to the return path. So that is a, quite a basic um, a mail flow. Now let's see at one of the th first things. Oh, and um, one important thing to note is that, um, unfortunately, because it's um, the, that from address, the, 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 the 5222 uh, is in the data section of the transmission. Unfortunately, um, there is no check during that session um, whether that a, is a valid um, address or something like that. So you can sp spoof anything um, that you would like to do. So uh, only the, the, the first um, mail from address will be checked uh, during the connection um, and that is um, performed in initially by the SPF. Was there any questions or? OK. Um, so SPF, Center Policy Framework, quite simple. It's a, just a DNS text record that contains an allow list of sending servers. I hope that all of you are, already have that as an as a absolute minimum. Um, and just to um, go back to that basics is uh, on the left side, we have the sending organization contoso.com with the IP address 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, and on the right hand side, you have the receiver fabricant.com. I wasn't very original with domain names, but sorry about that. But anyways, um, the Contoso organization is sending a mail, the receiving side fabricant.com during the connection um, gets the elocontoso.com with the IP address of the sending organization and gets the uh, mail from uh, mail at contoso.com. Um, if you're not speaking, could you uh, mute your uh, microphone? Thank you. So um, this is during the connection and what happens next? The receiving side is uh, using that contoso.com um, information and performs a DNS lookup, searches for a text record, finds this text record via SPDF1, and finds a specific IP address range in that um, uh, record. 
and that corresponds this this gives a match and that means that uh, for SPF that sending server um, is allowed to send that mail and then the receiving side will allow that mail to happen or has a, a SPF pass. How do you um, uh, uh, create such a SPF text record? Well, just the basics. Uh, this is an example. And um, um, I, uh, it always starts uh, with V is SPF1 um, to just to indicate with what kind of text record this is. And this is a running theme with uh, all kinds of mail related DNS records. Um, then we have the uh, matching uh, side um, and specific, specifically you can add uh, IP4, IP6, um, uh, IP addresses or ranges, or you can add a, a record uh, such as mail server.nl uh, that is, um, 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 has to be resolved to an IP address. And that is a, a, a just a, a, an important thing is that um, you can only have uh, a, a maximum of 10 DNS lookups, and that will be an important part later on. Um, so IPv4, IPv6, and A records can be added. Um, you can also add an include, um, which is basically a, just a reference to another SPF record. For instance, if you have a third party um, um, uh, a ticket system on anything and that has to send mail, you can include their SPF record. Um, and it only um, adds the matches. So to include only effects, if there's a, a lot of uh, uh, IP4, IP6 and A records, it only includes that in um, your um, matching algorithm. Um, for instance, if there is a, um, um, a, a more strict or less strict um, SPF record in that include, that will be ignored. Only the IP addresses and the A records will be included. Um, so, and, and then the last part is the action that has to be performed, or basically the the um, the all catch all. The action is actually um, the minus uh, that is performed before it. Um, the uh, plus, basically in all of those entries and tags, you can add a plus, but it's not necessary, not required, so you can omit that, and that's why you don't see that here. Um, and the catch-all, that's for all the other um, addresses that are not included in that line before then. So it has to be at the end, and preferably you want to go for a minus all, and that will fill any address, any IP address that is not included in any of those A records, uh, IP records, or in the includes. So coming back to my initial remark about those 10 DNS lookups, that is cumulative. So that means that in this case, I have one DNS lookup for mailsoftware.nl. So that's one. And then I have to include, so that's two, and then it depends whether um, that include also has a records um, that contribute to that uh, DNS lookup. So um, that is a risk with working with includes, especially with third party uh, um, uh, third parties that you don't have any control over because you can go over your cumulative limit of 10 DNS lookups and that will result in a um, SPF error and that can result into a, a higher degree of, of false positives for your mail. So check your syntax regularly and especially those includes. Um, there are luckily a lot of tools that can do that for you and calculate uh, very easily the cumulative DNS lookups. So, but that is one of the most um, common mistakes I've seen um, when using SPF records and includes next to having the um, the all the the catch all uh, as a soft fail, um, I preferably want that to have a a fail because with the soft fail you you generally say I'm not sure whether I, all of these IP addresses well if I have listed them all and with the dash all well that gives me a more certain degree that you have your whole mail flow. Um, under control, which isn't easy, I admit. So 
Um, one thing I didn't mention is an example is the MX record. So you could also add the MX records automatically. Um, I generally don't uh, like that because uh, first of all, that also includes a DNS lookup and it uh, it implies that your ingress and egress of your mail flow is the same, the same server. And uh, certainly with um, um, th that could be the case with your on-prem organization, uh, but that is not necessarily the case with Exchange Online, or that is not the case with Exchange Online. Your MX record is different than your um, uh, outgoing SNTP uh, or your outgoing IP addresses. So just, just to be aware that that is an option, but um, I tend not to use it, especially with, with Exchange Online, I don't use that. So, that is um, ESPF, and let's go to DKIM. Um, and DKIM, sorry, just click too fast, is stands for Domain Key Identified Mail, and basically it's just a um, signing uh, um, um, mechanism in your ongoing organization, and it signs every mail um, with a private public key construction um, and every mail is signed, is and that sign is, is added to that mail, and the receiving end can check uh, every of those mails uh, with the public key, and then can validate that whether it has been sent by your organization, uh, and even if there have been any changes in that mail in the body and or in specific headers, like the to and the from and the subject uh, line and stuff like that. Just quick how that flow works. On the left-hand side, we have uh, Contoso, and that has uh, a private key, and um, it's called MSFT, um, and it will sign uh, the headers and the body with that key, the private key. So that's signed, sent to the receiver Fabricam, and Fabricam is um, checking the addition of a DKIM um, uh, uh, in the mail. So um, in the headers of that received mail, um, there is a se section about DKIM and, and within that it says, uh, just a little excerpt is uh, the D is Contoso.com. That means the domain is Contoso.com and the selector, the specific key that has been used to sign that mail is MSFT. That's quite important information to have for the receiving side and also for troubleshooting as well. Uh, because the receiving side then performs a DNS lookup, um, and that's kind of hard coded. It takes the selector name, MSFT, and then performs um, the underscore domain key, adds uh, to that to the dot .com. So it fabricates this full qualified domain name, performs a DNS lookup, finds um, a DNS text record with also, where the V is DKIM1, and then uh, and I've shortened it because of uh, readability, um, and the public key that the receiver can use to verify that mail. So, checks hashes with received mail, VFP, and if those check out, then it's a DKIM pass. Has there been uh, any changes in either the body or uh, in the headers, then um, it will be a DKIM fail. Um, and there are valid reasons for for changing for that something has changed, but it can also be, for instance, um, if you have a transport rule that is added after uh, DKIM has been uh, the, the DKIM sign has been added. So that means that the body has been changed and that will fail DKIM. Uh, forwarding is another example, uh, and it all and some other examples I will come back to. So how will does a, a record look like? Well, in Exchange Online, um, every uh, domain already has a, a, a um, uh, uh, because uh, Exchange Online is using a private key, it, it has a sign, you don't have access to that. So what they do is they create a, um, a, a text records themselves and you have to create a C name um, towards, uh, towards that record. So this is the uh, text record for, from Microsoft. Um, this is just an example value on the on Microsoft.com. And mm, for control, so that should mean that the FQDN uh, is selector one domain key, control.com, so C name towards that value. 
And if you look at the content of this text record, so this is the C name and this is uh, the, the text record, it contains uh, a little piece of what we said, uh, mentioned in, uh, earlier in the previous slide, the version or what kind of protocol that text record is, um, uh, the, the, the signing algorithm, but most importantly, the public key that is used to verify the hashes. Um, and an interesting note is that the N value, that means that that is the uh, key length of uh, the use certificate. And this example is uh, 1024 uh, uh, bits, um, but preferably you want to have that on 2048 bits. Um, it, it's not a real big uh, issue, but uh, this had uh, the, the, the obviously the uh, 2048 has a, a high degree of um, security in that and um, more robust um, algorithm results. Um, and I've, I've noticed that a lot of organizations already have DKIM and uh, or haven't looked at it or did uh, configure it, but uh, perhaps some years ago, uh, Microsoft made a change a few years back um, uh, and upgraded those uh, um, 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 key length of key size. And uh, if you want to check whether it's the case for your specific domain, you can use that with remote PowerShell and uh, with the get, get DKIM signing convic and an identity and then the specific domain and then check whether uh, it's this value, the selector one key sizes, um, either uh, 1024 or 2048. Um, if this, if you see something like this, and you see this is performing, this is more than five years ago um, that it has been created, you can use the rotate decomp signing config and then upgrade that key size, and then it will change one selector, and then after a few days it will change the other uh, selector, uh, and that's important. Uh, waiting time uh, is important uh, because uh, of DNS. Um, uh, synchronization and transmission uh, throughout uh, the internet um, because you want to have that the correct uh, selector used for the uh, for the sending mail and then the, um, uh, the ability of the receiving size to uh, verify that hash. Um, so and that is the other reason why you actually want to have two selectors in your own organization. So if you do not have exchange online uh, exchange online protection um, so uh, you can uh, have an appliance, but still it's very much, much important to have two uh, keys for that. Um, so, um, uh, and another uh, 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 important thing to notice is that even if you do not have made a country, uh, configuration of DKIM, uh, Exchange Line Protection already sends every mail with a, 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 DKIM, um, um, a DKIM signed. But it uses your default domain, uh, and most probably that will be your own Microsoft.com domain that has uh, already a uh, private key and a public key published. Um, another thing um, um, that is quite important to uh, take note is that if you have a third party or a software as a service solution, like the ticketing system, um, it's best to check whether they have, uh, they support DKIM signing as well. Um, and if they don't, well, you have to um, um, think of another solution, um, perhaps sending it through Microsoft 365 or Exchange Online, if that's possible, if you have low um, 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 flow rate. Um, uh, but for m bulk uh, things, uh, that is not an option, um, and you might have to uh, seek some other solutions or perhaps um, um, some solutions I will talk later on. Um, so that is DKIM, and basically the this is the the most most um, uh, thing you have to do as an uh, exchange admin is just check whether your key length, uh, your key size is correct. Have you uh, enabled it for each of your accepted domains that uh, is sending mail, and have those uh, text records or your C names uh, uh, published in the in your uh, DNS domains as well. So. That was SPF and DKIM. Then we go to DMARC. Um, DMARC is the domain based message authentication reporting and conformance. And I always have to look up that acronym because that's just not very nice. Um, so, 
And this is one of the most encompassing protocol and uses both SPF and DKIM signals to authenticate those mails. And like I said, that spoofing trick you can do with the mail from and the from um, behind the data. Um, well, it actually checks the from address uh, in, in the, the, the RFC 5222 from, so behind the data, uh, like we talked about. Um, and another thing that is uh, a very uh, much appreciated addition is a reporting capability so that um, organization that, that um, receive any mails uh, or, of uh, uh, mails that claim to be from your organization but fail DMARC, for instance, uh, either through uh, SPF fail or DCOM fail or both, uh, well, both. Um, and that will they will send you a report uh, if you have configured that in your uh, policy in your text record and we'll come back to that later on but and you can see and have some little bit more control what is happening with your mail flow which was not possible with SPF for instance um how does that flow work quite simplified um Kotosu sends a mail Fabricum receives that mail and then Fabricum um, checks the RFC 522 from um, address and in this case that should be contoso.com and takes that record um, uh, that domain and then performs a DMARC lookup at underscore DMARC.contoso.com and looks up whether there is a text record. In this case there is a text record, DMARC V is DMARC1 we see the pattern here, I think, and then uh, P is reject. Uh, there have to be a semicolon here as well, but the P is reject. That is the policy. If um, this mail fails the DMARC check, then it has to be rejected by your by the receiver, or that's the suggestion that Contoso.com makes. Um, so I need another check that uh, um, the receiving ends does is it takes that Contoso.com domain and checks the SPF. So basically the process that we had with SPF, it performs for specifically the Contoso.com address found in that um, data section of the from. Um, and then we'll perform that, that check. Well, in this case, uh, it finds this text record Contoso.com as a, a record. Um, uh, let's assume that that is indeed the sending organization and then that SPF will check out. But it will also perform a DCAM check for um, the Contoso.com uh, domain. We'll f um, uh, it will also check the selector in that mail and then we'll check that DCAM. Um, and uh, um, uh, if it all checks out, so if, if SPF uh, and DCAM don't fail, uh, one one of them can fail, but if they both fail, then, then it's a DMARC failure and then it will um, will um, result in a DMARC fail. But if one of them aligns, then it will be a pass. Um, um, uh, 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 how does such a DMARC text record uh, look? Well, we already saw the VSD mark one, um, and um, that is uh, just to uh, indicate the protocol. Then we have P is this the policy, and you can have none quarantine and reject. None is for monitoring, so you can have uh, if you configure your monitoring address, you can uh, know receiving sense that you receive want to receive um, reporting, but not any action. Quarantine and reject are actions that are suggested when DMARC has been failed. Um, if you have subdomains um, or don't have subdomains, but you want to protect yourself, you can have an SP and that is specific for subdomains that uh, don't have a uh, explicit DMARC record themselves. Um, and that means that you can have a more stringent um, uh, policy for your subdomains, which is a very nice addition. Also something that SPF, for instance, doesn't have. Um, so the RUA, that is the report for aggregating reports. Um, and uh, that is the mail address um, that uh, you want those reports sent to. Um, and without any other configurations, that has to be a mail address in the same domain as where this DMARC record contains. Otherwise, you have to have some extra steps. Um, and 
the aggregate is an aggregation of specific events and then sent um, uh, mostly daily towards your um, um, uh, this address. But if you want to have specific failures, uh, you can have a forensic report with additional information sent to another address or the same address. Uh, but do note that um, not all organizations support um, um, sending a forensic report because um, of privacy concerns. So just do note that the uh, forensic report is not always sent. Um, and uh, the FO is for reporting options. Um, uh, I believe zero is default. One is if um, either of the SPF or DKIM fails, and zero is for if only uh, if both of them fails. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've I forgot to look up the specific values. I always do FO uh, is one. Um, so another interesting part is the PCT, and especially if you are working towards a more string and DMARC policy. Uh, you might not want to have all your mails adhere to a uh, reject. And in this case, if you have PCT is 50, 50% 50 of those mails that fail your DMARC check will adhere to the policy and the other 50% won't adhere to that policy. Um, and 100% is that every uh, mail that, uh, and the 100 is default, but it, it, 100% um, 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 of the mails that fail the DMARC check will be failed, uh, will get a DMARC is fail. And that way you can um, limit the damage that uh, a specific misconfiguration in your organization perhaps has. Okay. So, and I've, I've skipped a lot of the details. Um, oh yeah, especially, especially uh, the underscore dmark.contosa.com, that is specific for the contosa.com mail. If you have a subdomain, you can have a dmark.services.contosa.com and you can have a specific dmark uh, policy on that, but that's not, not necessary. Um, kind of depends on your organization, how you are on your mail configuration. Um, one thing uh, I will just glance through is the uh, strict versus relaxed configuration. Uh, I will just mention a concept. You can configure that in uh, DMARC that to uh, have it either relaxed or strict. And what do, does that mean? Relaxed means that softsource.contoso.com is considered equal as contoso.com, which is the organizational domain. Um, and if you configure strict, um, if you have services.fabricam.com in any of your mail from um, uh, settings, that is not the same as fabricam.com. Um, there can be reasons to, to have that uh, more strict. Um, the default value is relaxed, um, especially if you have subdomains and work a lot with subdomains, then you have to take account uh, whether you have strict or relaxed or want to have strict or uh, keep it default on relaxed. Um, but that's going to dive deep in, in specific um, uh, organizations. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And another thing is the BME. And that is probably something you might not have heard of or thinking about, well, that's not the acronym I generally see with SPFD, Kim and DMARC, but still, um, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, it stands for the brand indicators for message identification, and that means that end users have a visual indication, like a uh, logo of the company, and that the server sender is authentic. Um, and they can see that directly in their messaging application very upfront. Um, and um, what do you need for BME? Well, one thing you have to have a logo that is trademarked and, re and registers trademarked, and that can be an interesting thing to, to have that. But if you have that, you can use that logo. Uh, you have to have that in a specific format, a, a, a vector um, a graphic file, SVG file format. And then you also have to have a verified mark certificate. It has to be signed by a, for instance, DG cert, and there's another uh, certificate, um, um, a party that uh, um, supplies that. And I think that both of those things cost money, extra money, um, and uh, take a lot of time into account. 
The technical parts you have to have is a valid DMARC record. You have to have DMARC in order to be able to use BME. Uh, so that means either quarantine or reject. Uh, P is none will not is not acceptable for BME. You have to have a, a quarantine or reject, and then you have to have a BME DNS text record. Um, and I will come come back to the syntax for that later. Also, you need a secure website for hosting that logo and the certificate. And the receiving site obviously must support uh, BME as well. Um, you can look at bmegroup.org for any organizations that support that. Unfortunately. Microsoft and uh, Outlook unfortunately do not support BME at this time. Uh, and I have, haven't heard any uh, updates during uh, Mac for that as well. But there are, even if you are an Exchange Online or anything like that, that still doesn't mean you don't have to implement or can't implement BME for those organizations, your partner organizations that do support BME. Um, how does that work? Um, sender, Contoso.com. Receiver Fabricam sends mail, and then the receiving side checks the DMARC, does it have a quarantine or, or a reject, and then performs a BME, BME record lookup. And it's also a hard-coded, uh, depending on the domain of that uh, mail, default dot underscore BME dot contoso dot com. And that is a um, text record with also the protocol and the logo and the certificate. And then when DMARC and BME are valid, then the logo is downloaded, cached, and shown to the user. If it doesn't uh, adhere to DMARC or any other uh, other BME recommend, uh, uh, um, um, things, then it will not show that logo. And how does that see? I've, I've pulled an uh, um, image from uh, bmegroup.org. Just basically here, instead of an A or F, anything like, you see the logo defined in that um, place and then the syntax already showed that in the uh, um, um, previous slide uh, the version uh, there has to be a dns text record again and l is the location of a secure uh, or is the secure uri for a, a logo file and uh, a is the, um, um, the certificate that has been used to sign the svg and the receiving side can then uh, look that up um, please note that the BME specification is still in draft. It's not hardened yet, so there can be a lot of changes, uh, especially currently the uh, A uh, value, uh, the uh, uh, certificate value is not um, um, required yet, but um, it probably will be. And think, things like, and you saw that in the uh, example, look at a good logo that is good re representative, isn't too small, isn't too large, and take into account things like dark mode um, and visibility in different backgrounds and stuff like that. So best to have a solid background, for instance. Um, and also you have to think whether uh, all of the investments are warranted. Uh, perhaps not all of the org uh, your organizations have any benefit with uh, BME or the cost do not um, are not valid or not worth the investment. So I have to pick up the pace a little bit, uh, but SRS, um, so we've um, hardened the uh, um, authentication, um, but there are valid modes where uh, forwarding, for instance, um, that spoofing as it were is as actually sort of valid. At the left hand side we have uh, Dave at Contoso.com that sends to via a fabricam.com a group uh, a distribution list to Willem. Dave sends, it checks out, Fabricam checks out, SPF, all those things check out and then that mail gets forwarded to Willem and then we have an issue because now the mail from is in a lot of cases still contoso.com, but the IP address points to fabricam.com and that does not align with the SPF record and that fails SPF. Um, the solution here is um, an SRS sending rewriting scheme and that changes that this address towards a fabricam address. So in that case, the return path and the SPF check will uh, will work, uh, will not fail. Unfortunately, that comes 
with another problem because you have to change that mail and the headers and that fails DMARC and DKIM. That's why we have authenticated received chain arc. And basically it's the same problem we had at first. Um, and uh, Fabricom uh, SRS has still changed that. So SPF works, but um, DKIM and DMARC checks have failed. Well, what ARC does is ARC works at Fabricom.com and adds an ARC seal to that specific mail. And in this case, wingtoys.com trusts Fabricom as an ARC intermediary. So it says, OK, I see that Fabricom has added an ARC seal and then um, Fabricom or oh, sorry, Wingtoys has said, I trust Fabricom. And in that case, that mail will be accepted as a valid mail. So we have implemented SPF DKIM DMARC, but now with SRS and uh, ARC, we can fix the forwarding issues that are created by those um, protocols. And how does that work in Exchange Online? Well, uh, well, luckily, uh, well, SPF DKIM DMARC, you have to configure yourself. Um, DKIM signing is done by Exchange Online Protection. SRS, ARC, um, those are, um, uh, SRS is automatically enabled, but you still have to look into some caveats that there are. And for ARC, you can set uh, intermediary trusted ARCs for your in the um, receiving side. MTA, STS, Dane, um, uh, check those other sessions as well. Um, and if you want to look at how Exchange Line does work, has a workflow, the, the, the art articles about that. I won't go through this uh, slide, but here you can see how that whole process of SPF, DKIM and DMARC work. Um, and to uh, a little bit to uh, work to a conclusion, if you have to work through a lot of um, um, uh, uh, domains and check them, I have written a PowerShell script that I've used, and it's more of an exercise in Git for myself, but I've published this publicly uh, at GitHub, um, uh, a DM Stark show anti spoof, and then you can see all of the DNS records that have been created for a specific domain or even in a bulk way, and then you can easily check if there are any configuration issues. So to conclude, general remarks for details, check the RFCs. This was a very, very high uh, or, or well, um, just the basics as it were. Furthermore, have, if you are working with this, have a good process in place um, and periodically check that. Luckily, a lot of uh, uh, organizations like Valley Mail and Demarkin offer services to check that for you. But if you don't have that, create a process and with, with a flow chart, for instance, like this as an example. Um, and if you have any park domains, protect them as well. Well, park domains are mails that you don't use for any mail uh, actively, uh, but to protect them, you can add um, um, an SPF min all and a DMARC P is reject, and then you're covered for, for any misuse of that domain. Um, so just take note of that. Also use uh, message header analyzer for analysis or the XRCA uh, site for when you have received headers and you're wondering what happened with that or just to figure out wh why something has been DMARC failed and stuff like that. And with my script, you can also check on another organization what they have configured and then combine those two to check what, what to troubleshoot. Um, another new remark, if you have, and I've mentioned it already a little bit, if you have a, 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 a ticketing service or a, some um, a software as a service, uh, uh, you and you cannot, or for instance, they don't have DKIM, for instance, and they don't, they won't support it, but you require DKIM for your own mail, well, consider either having a separate domain, fully separate domain, or a subdomain of your uh, main domain. Um, but still, if you use subdomains, keep those, those alignment things uh, in mind. Luckily, standard the default va values are relaxed, but if you want to make it more strict, then you have to take into account all of those subdomains as well. Um, and lastly, well, this is all for your organization and to uh, enable receiving organizations to 
validate the, authentic and the authenticity of your mail, but to prevent man in the middle attack and other uh, attacks, consider to implement NTA, STS and Dane uh, and TLS uh, RPT, that's the reporting of those TLS connections uh, as well. And like I said, I refer to the other sessions for more information on that. I've listed all of those RFCs. So um, 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 if you want to know more, certainly look them, look them up. Um, and now go fix your mail flow, I would say. Um, so I will go through some questions, but um, in the meantime, if you have um, uh, another session you want to follow or anything else, thank you for your attention and your time and your questions. Um, and I hope you have learned anything uh, useful today. So, and with that, I will go through any of those messages. Um, sadly, many DNS providers are not yet DNSSEC ready, so can't use Dane. Yeah, DNSSEC is a, is a requirement, yeah. But uh, yeah, MTA SDS is already currently in a, you can already uh, configure that. I've done that as well. So, um, um, check that other session for that because it's quite easy to to configure that. Uh, so um, let me see. Are there any added steps required for policies to to apply? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a good point. Office 365 or Exchange Online. Uh, even though if the the sending uh, domain has configured P is reject. Um, a Microsoft 365 will consider or will handle it as if it was quarantine and will regard it as um, um, uh, so you could add a transport rule or you could trust uh, or implement any NC spoofing policies um, that will uh, work with that. Um, that is actually uh, I've, I've I've got a lot of comments about why isn't Microsoft uh, Exchange Online not adhering or um, following the policy P is reject. Well, it's allowed in an RFC. Um, and um, well, it gives a little bit more control on the receiving organization, what to do with those mails that actually have to be rejected. So, so transport rules or uh, anti-spoofing policies and stuff like that. Uh, let me see if there any other questions. Uh, what is everyone using for DCAM signing on-prem? Ah, yeah, there, there are some applications, but generally I prefer um, just to use Exchange Line Protection anyway, um, but I might be biased. Another option are appliances if you have to be fully on-prem. So uh, appliances would be my preferred solution just to have that distinct from, from uh, your Exchange servers, but it kind of depends on your organization. Uh, but yeah, this is also a solution, a plugin into Exchange itself. Let me see. Um, yeah, somebody's commenting on the Telnet. <laughs> think, uh, let me see. Uh, with Azure, MTA, SDS is super easy. The SSL search are given by uh, Microsoft. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, you can add common uh, uh, custom domains and, and for any custom domains you add to your uh, MTA SDS, uh, uh, especially if you have um, an Azure DevOps uh, environment uh, and an, an Azure static web app, uh, you can all basically automate it quite rapidly. Um, and indeed, um, you have to have a hard coded uh, FQDN for your domain and you can add that and then it, it's already secured by uh, 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 the, the process of uh, Azure Web uh, Static Web App. So yeah, and I prefer a Azure DevOps uh, way. So for any changes or any additions to or, or any uh, mail domains you add, you can just easily add a custom domain to that Static Web App. Um, you might have to look. Uh, I, I believe uh, for the free uh, SKU, uh, you have two domains, and for free you have to pay for them, but it's a few dollars per month, I believe, or something like that. It kind of depends on how many domains you want to protect with MTA STS. Yeah. So. Any other questions or are we at time? We are at time. <laughs> Over time. Any last questions? Now's your 
opportunity. And otherwise, you can uh, contact me via the contact information in this slide. The recording will be made available and I will uh, try to make uh, the PowerPoint presentation available as well because there are some uh, links and notes in it that are quite valuable as well. OK, so no questions anymore. I don't believe that, but I think you're, you had a, heard enough of me. So uh, thank everybody and uh, hope to hear and see you uh, at a physical Mac perhaps next year. So thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.